Fellowship, a ministry of First Presbyterian Church in Perkesee, Pennsylvania. Our Reformed Fellowship meets at the A&N Diner in Sellersville every Thursday morning at 8 o'clock. So if you would like to join us, please do so. Uh, the church is located on the corner of 5th and Race Streets in Perkesee. It's a small red brick building. Uh, we are undergoing renova renovations at the moment, and uh, I'm very pleased to say that um, the, the uh, windows are looking much, much better than they have been uh, since before I arrived. So uh, we are well on our way. There's still much to be done, but uh, I'm very thankful for the work of the deacons of the Presbytery of Philadelphia and uh, those uh, of my own church who have also contributed their time and efforts to uh, make this place a place of beauty, of glory, and of blessing to the people of God. Uh, as we get started today, I'll note that we are making our way through R.C. Sproul's book, Essential Truths of the Christian Faith. Uh, this is a book which uh, provides a concise summary statement of different points of theology. And if you are a layman and don't have time to weed through great works of theology, um, this is a very, very helpful, succinct way to uh, understand the basics of Christian theology. Um, Dr. Sproul does a nice job on the whole of uh, summarizing in a brief way um, the great teachings of Scripture. We've begun a new section in Dr. Sproul's book on the major topic of salvation. We introduced that last time, and today uh, we are uh, beginning uh, a new discussion about predestination, which of course is a topic of considerable debate uh, among uh, Christians, and as well, uh, it actually has uh, repercussions for uh, those who are not Christian as well. Everyone has to uh, give some thought to a plan for history. Is my life self-directed or directed by someone else? Um, what is the um, view of world history which I should hold to? Is it something that is planned out in eternity past or is it merely uh, the result of innocent chance events uh, which come to, to place over time. Uh, I'll make that brief introduction to predestination uh, and uh, I want to make a couple of points in that regard. Uh, one is that human thinking always teeters uh, from one direction to the other, either uh, in indeterminism or determinism. Fate excuse me, fate on the one hand or chance on the other. Uh, is life uh, an irrational movement uh, which is dependent upon uh, momentary choices uh, that uh, affect or shape destinies, or is life planned? Is life set and predetermined either by mechanical, physical forces, chemical forces, uh, movements of the stars, or a God who superimposes his plan on human history. Uh, pagan thinking, that is non-Christian thinking, uh, veers between these two, uh, indeterminism and determinism. Things are up to chance or things are planned in advance, or at least determined by our fate. And so uh, that's the way that pagans think about the world under these two uh, poles. Now, in our modern age, we are very much uh, given over to indeterminism, uh, chance events. Um, existentialism is that philosophy whereby I'm not determined by th forces and things outside of me, but I uh, am the captain of my faith. Uh, I, I am the master of my own soul. I make my own choices, and my choices determine my own destiny. So, uh, the existentialist movement that is uh, very much a part of our world today is really uh, an expression of this indeterminate point of view, um, this sense that history is governed by chance, by random events, and I can choose my own destiny. 
um, based on how I want my life to unfold. So that's very much the, the point of view uh, that is current today. Consequently, um, when uh, people come to listen to what the Bible has to say about this matter of the course of history and is uh, human life planned or unplanned? Is it determined or and set and fixed or is it uh, open to uh, decisions and, and chance events? Um, people tend to read the biblical point of view from their pagan mindset and try to uh, subject the Christian point of view to either indeterminism or determinism. And consequently, when we come as Reformed uh, Christians, as those who are descendants of uh, Calvin and the Apostle Paul, Calvin, Augustine, and the Apostle Paul, and Jesus himself, and all of Scripture, uh, when we come to that point of view, uh, our modern age tends to read us in the light of determinism that God has a plan for human history, that he has ordained whatsoever should come to pass. Uh, God knows the end from the beginning, and he works all things after the counsel of his will. And so the pagan listening to that says, well, this is a, a, a form of determinism. Uh, it, it's fatalism. Uh, it, it treats man as a robot. He's determined uh, by something beyond his power to do that which he doesn't want to do or really has no uh, role to play in it whatsoever. And so uh, pagan people and Christians, generally speaking, who've come out of paganism perhaps and are at least uh, within the, the external house of God, uh, they, they tend to listen to uh, a Reformed point of view and immediately say, well, that sounds like determinism and we don't want that especially in our modern age where our minds are so filled with this irrational uh, feeling based uh, chance environment where we choose our own destiny uh, a point of view which argues for the sovereignty of God in history and time and uh, his ultimate purpose and plan affecting all things that occur in life that sounds very much like determinism and it's uh, very much rejected uh, by many today. And also, I would suggest to you that the lens by which people view the Christian, what I would consider the Christian point of view, that, that of the Reformed faith, the lens by which people view that is from this uh, uh, chance, fate point of view. And so they mischaracterize Quite often, they mischaracterize what uh, the Reformed point of view is with regard to predestination and what God's purpose is and his plan is for history and time. And so they read uh, that in the light of uh, philosophical developments in the past, like Plato and, and so forth, and they consider uh, history as set and fixed, and, and it's a form of fatalism, and they don't want that. That's suffocating, that destroys their humanity, that now, it eliminates the significance of their choices, that um, uh, makes mankind just robotic and utterly at the uh, mercy of their fate. And that seems to be very dehumanizing. And so there is a quick rejection of uh, scriptures, uh, particularly as they have been understood and explained by Reformed pastors and teachers like Augustine, Calvin, and uh, Bob Inc. and Burkhoff, uh, Van Til, and so forth. So I want to uh, caution you as we discuss predestination uh, to put aside the, the pagan concepts of uh, random chance events on the one hand or uh, a strict fatalism and recognize that, Bible, that the Bible presents us a completely different point of view. It does allow for freedom of choice, but it also affirms that God is sovereign in all of history and everything happens according to his plan. Some of the differences between a Christian view of history and that of paganism are as follows. One, in terms of determinism, determinism is a blind mechanical force. 
that indeed destroys the significance of your choices, your, your individuality, your humanity. It strips you bare of these things. Paganism is destructive in its point of view. And so a deterministic point of view is something that I and Christians, Reformed Christians, would be hostile to. We do not submit to that kind of thing. Predestination is the governing of all things by a sovereign, personal, loving, covenant God. And so in his actions and his plans throughout the course of history, he acts in ways which, first of all, are in accord with his justice. So uh, determinism or fate has no regard for justice. There is no sense that what happens in history is really determined by uh, the good or that which is just, it's just what happens. And so what is, is. And you can't ascribe a moral value to that. There's no moral component to determinism, to fatalism. It just is what it is. But the Christian point of view, in terms of God's predestination of all human events in history, are conducted by a personal God who is involved in history and who ensures that justice and righteousness prevails through the course of history and especially at the end of history and time. So uh, there is law, there's a place for law, for moral rectitude, and so fatalism and uh, predestination are of a different temper, different spirit. One is blind fate, the other is a personal God who conducts all things in a righteous and good manner. It's just part of the distinction. On the other side, in terms of indeterminism or uh, random chance, uh, uh, feelings-based uh, personal choice in, uh, environment, which we very much have today, the Christian point of view does recognize that we make free choices, that we operate in accord with our nature and our will. And so we do not feel that God is fixing our lives such that I must do something that might be entirely opposed to my wishes and I am forced to not believe or forced to believe in Jesus? No. We act in accord with our own inner impulses, our own will, our own desires, our own choices are ours and we are accountable and responsible for them. The distinction that Christianity draws is that our nature is what governs our choices. And so if our nature was good, if we were innocent and free to do anything which was good, then we could make good choices. But the testimony of the Bible is that our nature is not morally good and fixed to do that which is good, but rather our nature is morally evil. We are corrupt. And so we act uh, as a result of that corrupt nature, and we choose that which our corrupt nature desires. And so the natural man on his own uh, chooses his sinful lifestyle. He chooses his own philosophies. He chooses his own religion. He chooses his own politics, economics, uh, uh, the loves that he enjoys his life, uh, relationships, all these are reflective of his own nature. And he will uniformly choose that which is in disobedience to God and his will because he is in rebellion against God at heart. There's an outward superficial conformity to some of the things which God says, uh, but uh, at the heart of the matter there is a rebellion against God given in those actions. So they are uniformly corrupted and polluted by sin. The Bible describes our nature as dead in trespasses and sins, and a dead man will not respond to God's offer of grace. Uh, God must sovereignly intervene in that situation. But we're getting a little bit further away from predestination than what we want at the moment. So, if you will, on the, the other side of a, a reform view, we do recognize the freedom of the will. It's just that it is bound by its nature to do what it wants. Just as a bird is bound by its nature to fly, a fish is bound by its nature to swim in the, in the ocean or in a lake, um, uh, and we are bound by our nature to walk on land, um, we, we act freely in accord with our nature, but our nature 
prescribes the, the realm in which we are going to operate. And the nature of man is sinful, and so he continually operates on the basis of that sinful nature. Uh, he will never choose for God on his own. So, predestination is that uh, doctrine in the Bible which says that God has a plan for the whole of human history, and that before history unfolds, he has determined in advance those who would be saved, and he sets them apart for that salvation by uniting them to Jesus Christ. And on the other hand, he uh, allows the, the wicked who are given over to their sin by their rebellion in Adam, he allows them to continue on in their sin. He passes over them and uh, allows them to suffer the consequences of their sin, which will include uh, death in this life, and then eternal separation from God, indeed the wrath of God forever and ever uh, in hell. And so uh, God has predetermined in advance the course of human history. He has determined who will be saved and who will be damned. And that is uh, the, the testimony of Scripture. You might say, well, where do we find that in the Bible? And there are many different places where we can go in that regard. Um, God chose Abraham and set him apart from all of the nations of the world at that time. It wasn't that Abraham chose God. God chose Abraham. God came to Abraham and said, get up and go to the land that I will show you. God took the initiative. He came to Abraham and chose him to be uh, the heir of grace and salvation. Uh, God chose Jacob as opposed to Esau, when they were in the womb of their mother. Remember, Jacob and Esau were twins, and as their mother, Rebekah, was carrying them, God said to Rebekah that the older will serve the younger. And it was a description of God's work of salvation in their hearts. Esau would be a rebel against God and would be subject to uh, Jacob. Jacob would be the one who would find favor with God and would be blessed by God with salvation. And Paul, uh, quoting from Genesis and also from uh, the prophet uh, Malachi in the first chapter of his uh, prophecy, Paul uh, notes that God chose Jacob and not Esau. He has compassion on whom he will have compassion, and he hardens whom he will harden. It does not depend on the man who runs or the man who wills, but on the God who has mercy. And so God is sovereign in that choice. And he made that choice, Paul emphasizes, before Jacob and Esau had done anything good or bad, before they had made any particular choice on their own. They were yet within the womb of their mother, Rebekah. And yet God chose Jacob and passed by Esau. And so this is predestination. You recall in Ephesians chapter 1, the apostle Paul, speaking about our salvation, uh, glorifies God for the fact that uh, he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the earth. Here is God's elective choice uh, occurring uh, uh, before we did anything good or bad, before we even existed. God chose us in Christ before the worlds were created. And then he goes on to say, in love he predestined us to adoption as sons. And so God makes this choice of us and sets us apart for Christ and to be the heirs of salvation. And this he has done in eternity past, prior to anything that we do. The initiative is with God. He chooses a people to save and he passes the rest over. And that is according to his mercy and grace. So God is sovereign in the choice of a people for himself. Uh, he does not look into the future to determine who will choose him and then make a choice of them. You know, this is the, the point of view of the Arminian. Uh, Dr. Sproul points out that everybody has a point of view on predestination. The Bible speaks about predestination. And so everybody who reads the Bible and respects what the Bible teaches have to try to explain what they think the Bible means when it talks about predestination. And that's what um, many... Uh, uh, Pelagian, semi-Pelagian, Arminian uh, believers uh, will do, and they uh, present it in this way, that 
God in eternity past foreknew all who would choose for him. God knows all things, and so he looks into the future and he sees that certain numbers of people will choose him and others will not. And so uh, in view of the fact that uh, John and Harry will choose for Christ and Fred and Estelle will not, uh, he then responds to their choice, that foreknowledge of their choice, and choosing them. And that's the typical way in which... Uh, uh, many in a broad evangelical church uh, and even in other uh, communions, if they have a, a point of view on predestination that is attempting to be biblical, uh, that, that's uh, the, the viewpoint that they will hold. God knows all things. He knows the future and all that could take place. And he knows who will choose and who will not choose. And so he chooses those who choose. Now you can see that the initiative here is really with us and with our choice. God only chooses us if we first choose him. It seems to go against what Jesus said to his disciples. He said, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. Jesus is the one who initiated the choice of his disciples, and that is always the way it happens. God takes the initiative and doesn't wait for us to respond. The reason why God does not look and wait for us to respond is because we will never choose for God. Again, our nature is set in rebellion against God, and it will never uh, choose for God. So if God were to look into the future and wait and see if anyone would choose him, nobody would choose him. Because they will act in accord with their nature, and their nature is evil in view of their sin in Adam. So the Arminian has this view that God knows what the future is like and, and people, certain people make choices for him and he then correspondingly chooses for them. Uh, let me uh, bring up a couple problems with that point of view. One is if indeed we have the idea that God knows all different possibilities, all the different permutations of our choices and whether we would choose, when we would choose, how we would choose, uh, if we would choose for him, uh, or, or not, uh, if God knows all these things, then he really doesn't know what the future will hold, does he? He knows all the, the million different possibilities that could possibly occur, but he doesn't know exactly what will happen until really we make our choice. And then consequently, if we make our choice in history, then he responds to that. So in fact, God, knowing all the bazillion different possibilities, really doesn't know anything for sure. He can't say, I know that uh, Harry and, and, and Jack will choose me and Fred and Estelle will not choose me. He just knows that that is a possibility for, both of, for all of them. They may choose, they may not choose. I can't know. So God really doesn't know what we will choose. He just knows that there may be a choice that we will make. So God really doesn't know the course of history. He just knows possibilities. Now, that's one way of viewing it, uh, and one way of criticizing the Arminian point of view. It leaves us with a God who doesn't really know what the future holds, because there are a bazillion different possibilities, and he knows them all, but he can't know which particular choice that we will make until we actually make that choice. And then he knows it along with the rest of us. So he doesn't know anything more than what we know in terms of what our choices will be. So th that's one problem. The other problem is, let us suppose that God does in fact know that uh, Jack and Harry will choose for him and Fred and Estelle will not. Uh, how can he know that those decisions are what history will bring about? unless history has already been set, unless there, there's already some sort of set plan for the various events of history and time, which God can then look at and say, okay, I know that Jack and Harry will choose me, because that's the way history is going to unfold. Well, if history is already set, planned, and determined, who made the plan? Who set history? Who fixed it in such a way that God can see what the future will hold and know that Jack and Harry chooses him and Fred and Estelle do not? How can God know that? The only way he can know it is if it's set. And if it's set, who set it? If God didn't set it, who did? 
And so you're back into a position of pagan thinking with fatalism, with chance, uh, running history. And here is fatalism or determinism, but here is a blind determinism, which God sits on the outside and sees this timeline and says, okay, that one's going to choose me. Okay, then I'll choose him. And that's definitely not a Christian point of view. That says that history is not under God's control. It's either functioning on its own, and so that, that's an inconceivable thing, or there's some other force or power directing the course of history. That too is inconceivable. God is God. He is absolute. He is in control of all things. Nothing happens apart from his sovereign will and purpose. And so if God can know that Jack and Harry will choose for him, it's because he has determined that in advance. History is determined not by fate, chance, but by God who sets the course of history in place. And so the reason why Jack and Harry choose for God is because God has already planned history and chosen them to be among his people. And he reveals himself to them in uh, a particular point of time when he applies the work of the gospel of Christ to their hearts and their lives. So uh, God has chosen us in Christ before the heavens and the earth. Uh, were made. And that choice is a sovereign choice, not dependent upon us. Um, let me read to you from uh, Paul's words from May, in Romans chapter 8, uh, where he talks about how all things work together for the good of those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. And so Paul recognizes that uh, God has a particular calling for some and not for all, and that he works all things out according to his own purposes. And so he develops that uh, in the following ways. He says, For those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. You can work backwards from that line of salvation and observe how God is the one who takes the initiative. It is God who glorifies, God who justifies, God who calls, God who predestines. And so God is the one in charge of that whole process from beginning to end. Now, if you're going to say, well, it's those whom he foreknows that he arranges all these things, you have to understand that his foreknowledge is not just the bare prescience of all that's going to possibly take place, but rather in, in the scriptures, this knowledge of God is a love that God sets upon us. God knows us in advance in that he loves us in advance. He sets his heart upon us. He pledges himself to us and for our salvation. And so this knowledge that God has here is not a bare analytical uh, concept that flitters through the, the uh, absolute brain of God, but rather it is an expression of his heart and of his will. He chooses us. He loves us. He knows us as a husband knows his wife, loves her, cares for her, is committed to her. That's the kind of love that God has for us who are elect in Christ. And so the the Doctrine of predestination, which we'll consider again next time as we continue with this, uh, is a doctrine which gives great comfort to the church. Uh, it's, it's something that should be treated with great care, and this notion of uh, people becoming robots is, is false. It has nothing to do with that. Um, the the, the, the uh, doctrine of predestination in no way suggests that our actions are unimportant. doesn't matter if I pray, if I uh, obey God, what will be will be, and so I can live as I please. God's determined it, and really I can blame God for whatever happens because it's really it's his fault in the end. These things are false uh, views of what predestination teaches. It uh, in no way conforms with what the Bible says about God. God is light. And in him there is no darkness at all, 1 John chapter 1. Uh, there is no evil in God. 
all his works are righteous and true. And so he is not to be blamed for our sins. We are individually accountable for our sins. But God is sovereign in his choice of a people. When he looks at the whole of humanity, all of humanity is subject to sin and could justly be punished by God and sent to hell. Because in Adam, we ate of the forbidden fruit. And God said that in the day you eat thereof, you will surely die. And so the justice of God is such that all of humanity could have been cast into hell for an eternity for that sin and for our individual sins. But God in his mercy was pleased to step in and to save some, setting them apart from the rest of humanity that they might be the objects of his love and compassion and mercy. God is not obligated by any means to show mercy and compassion to anyone. His justice could demand that each and every one be punished with eternal hell. But because God is also gracious and merciful, he was pleased to set aside some to be the objects of his love and compassion. And so he saves them by delivering them out of the kingdom of darkness, bringing them into the kingdom of his own son. His spirit causes them to be regenerated, born again, such that they are enabled to see their, their condition in sin and cry out to God for salvation and plead with him. And they are drawn irresistibly to Jesus Christ. And so they are saved. We'll talk about this more as we make our way through this topic of predestination. Uh, but it is a message which brings great comfort to the church because we know that God loves us and he loves us so much that he loved us before we were born, before we did anything. And he loved us in full view of who we were and what we would do in the course of life. And yet he still loved us, sent his son to die for us, atoned for our sins at the cross, gave us his spirit to be a down payment and pledge of the eternal life that he's bringing to us in eternity to come. The doctrine of predestination is a great comfort to the church and ought to be explained to the church so that we might be uh, given that comfort, might have the assurance that indeed God loves me. He chose me in eternity past. He brought me to himself in history and time. And therefore I know of his great love. And I know that he that began a good work in me will bring it to completion at the day of Christ because he is sovereign over history and time. And he can secure my salvation uh, according to his sovereign will. Uh, so there, there's so much to say about this and we'll have to uh, put it on uh, for our next video. Uh, next time we'll talk a little bit more about reprobation or what some describe as double predestination and we'll consider that and uh, try to come to grips with what the scriptures say on that as well. This is Pastor McLaren for First Presbyterian Church in Perkinsie, Pennsylvania. Uh, I hope this video is helpful to you. It'll be a blessing and encouragement and uh, please share it with others if you uh, benefit from it. Uh, at the same time, come join us at church. Uh, we meet at 11 o'clock every Sunday morning on the corner of Fifth and Ray Streets. God bless. Take care. Bye. Amen.